the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Good evening. I cannot express in words how deeply moved and inspired I am to be here with all of you celebrating peace. All of you being here and me being able to be here has deep personal significance for me because much of my life has been affected by war. My mother lived in Japan during World War II and she lived in Korea during the Korean War. My father served in the army for 30 years, and he fought in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. I graduated from West Point. I served in the army for seven years, and I was deployed to Baghdad. But this celebration is not about waging war. It's about waging peace. Waging peace means that peace is not sitting alone in a quiet room. Peace is action. Peace is an activity. Peace is community. And look at what happens when people come together as a community and wage peace. 200 years ago in America, anyone who was not a white male landowner was oppressed. If you were African American, Asian, Hispanic, female, even if you were white but you did not own land, you were oppressed. But look at how far our country has come because of the women's rights, civil rights, and workers' rights movements. I'm half Korean, a quarter white, and a quarter black, and I grew up in Alabama, and the fact that I'm even here shows you how far our country has come. <laughs> 500 years ago, things such as democracy, the right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, women's and civil rights virtually did not exist anywhere on the planet. Now they're widespread. State-sanctioned slavery existed on a global scale for thousands of years, and it built the backbone of many countries and empires around the world. But now, state-sanctioned slavery has been abolished. I've never met anyone who's owned a slave. I've never met anyone who's been a slave. If I told all of you that I owned a slave, you would call the police. But who would have ever thought a few hundred years ago that our world would be like that? So we have come so far, and think about how much further we can go. But how can we get there? In the Army, I learned that the first thing you need in order to accomplish a mission is what Einstein called our strongest survival advantage, cooperation brotherhood, solidarity, in other words, community. Our mission is to create a peaceful world that is free of nuclear weapons, and we are certainly a community. We are a community of people who believe firmly that because of nuclear weapons, war is no longer just a moral issue. War is an issue that threatens human survival. We are a community of people who believe with conviction the change must happen, but the change will never happen as long as conscientious people do nothing. We are a community of people who know that all things are possible when people wage peace. Leadership means motivating people to work together 
toward a shared goal. And people trained in peace leadership can create many more communities around the world waging peace. That is what the peace leadership program will do. Right now, the training that people get in waging war is much better than the training pe that people get in waging peace. The peace leadership program will bridge the gap. During the past month, I've traveled around the country speaking with young people. I've spoken with many of the young people who are joining us this evening. Can all the students please stand up? <clears throat> And what I can tell you, what I can tell you, based on my conversations with them, is that with young people like these, there is no reason to despair for our future, and there is every reason to be hopeful. So, I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. I want to thank all of you for welcoming me into your community. And I want to thank all of you for waging peace, not war. Thank you. We are now 20 years past the fall of the Berlin Wall, something that before it fell seemed like an impossible dream. And we should remember, as we remember uh, this anniversary of the fall of that wall, that um, amazing things are possible, things you never would believe could happen, do happen, miracles happen, things that we totally don't expect. So I think that our, our work and our vision of a world without nuclear weapons it falls into the same category. It's not an impossible dream. And once it happens, people will look back and say, well, yes, of course, of course, there were people who made that happen, and all of you are part of those people who will be part of making that happen. At the foundation, we educate and advocate for peace. We seek to overcome obstacles of ignorance, apathy, and hostility. We seek a world free of domination and double standards. First and foremost, we seek a world free of the omnicidal threat of nucle that nuclear weapons pose. Our annual evening for peace is meant to accomplish three goals, to shine a light on peace leadership and world citizenship, to honor our deeply deserving awardees, and to inspire new peace leaders. We thank you all for being an, impor an important part of this evening for peace. I want to give you a brief report on the state of the foundation as we approach our 28th year. Our membership has expanded to 31,000 people, individuals, and organizations. Our action alert network that uh, sends messages to the Congress and to uh, the administration now has over 26,000 participants. Our Sunflower e-newsletter reaches thousands of people all over the world, keeping them abreast of information related to nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament. Our latest DVD, which you saw earlier, has been viewed more than 3,500 times online and is being shown across the country in classrooms and public access television stations. Uh, earlier this year, we transmitted to the White House more than 200,000 signatures on our appeal for U.S. leadership for a nuclear weapons free world. The Foundation's websites, wagingpeace.org and nuclearfiles.org, have more than 750,000 unique visitors each year. The Foundation has already this year had more than 300 articles in the press. The Foundation's Swackhammer video contest uh, drew more than 120 entries this year on a theme of the need for nuclear disarmament. Uh, these have been viewed more than 10,000 times online, and they're really good. I encourage you to take a look. 
Our Kelly Peace Poetry Awards had more than 2,000 entries this year in children, teenage, and adult categories. In the past two years, we've edited and published two books on the need to abolish nuclear weapons, both of them important anthologies. We also produce various other publications throughout the year, including our annual report, the annual Kelly Lecture, and various briefing booklets. This year, we formed a new chapter of the foundation in Silicon Valley, and we're very excited about the enthusiasm that they are bringing to their work up there. Fellows of the foundation, Daniel Ellsberg and Martin Hellman, are engaged in important research and writing projects. We have a new peace leadership program. You just heard uh, about that from Paul Chappell. We're very excited to have Paul on our staff and uh, already amazed by the wonderful work that he's doing around the country. In addition to having a superb staff, the foundation also has many enthusiastic interns, volunteers, and supporters, and a dedicated board of directors. I bow to you all, and I thank you deeply for the work that you do. Uh, without your efforts, your ongoing efforts, this foundation would not be completing its 27th year, looking forward with optimism and, uh, and having much more hope that our uh, goals will be accomplished. Uh, in 2009, the foundation has had a dramatically different environment in which to work. While we remain judiciously nonpartisan, we do now have a new president who shares our vision, and that is a major step forward. In Prague this year, as you heard earlier, he stated, he said, I state clearly and with conviction America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Now, he also said, I'm not naive. It may not happen in my lifetime. Um, well, uh, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is here to try to assure that it does happen within your lifetime, President Obama. In fact, much sooner, we think that uh, there's an urgency to the matter that we will, that we will continue to try to speak out on and press you to move forward on. So that is where we stand. And I'd like to uh, conclude with just a few comments on our theme for this evening, Women for Peace. First, it seems more natural for, for women as childbearers to protect and nurture life than to destroy it. We need their leadership in the areas of peace and nonviolence. And we, need, and, and we need men to do better at learning such perspectives. Second, what woman would not prefer for her children and all children to have the opportunity to be fed, sheltered, educated, and provided with health care rather than being sacrificed on the altar of war. Third, women have long been leaders in asserting themselves for a better and more peaceful world. In 1889, Bertha von Suttner wrote a book called Lay Down Your Arms. It was Bertha von Suttner that convinced Alfred Nobel to establish the Nobel Peace Prizes and who herself became the first female recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. It was Eleanor Roosevelt who led the United Nations in creating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, an absolutely foundational document for a peaceful future. Fourth, a number of our sister organizations working for a peaceful world are women's groups that have made a substantial contribution to building peace. A great example is Another Mother for Peace, which had the ironic and iconic tagline, war is not healthy for children and other living things. <laughs> Finally, in the past, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has honored some truly outstanding women, including Nobel laureates Mairead Corrigan McGuire, 
and Jody Williams. We've also honored Mary Travers, Hafsad Abiola, Queen Noor of Jordan, Bianca Jagger, Anne Ehrlich, Helen Caldicott, and Elizabeth Mon Borgesi. We draw encouragement from the roles played by women in seeking to build a more decent world. Our 2009 honorees have made quiet but large and important contributions to building a better world. To all the young people in the audience tonight, please learn and take inspiration from these two extraordinary women that you'll be hearing from and know that your lives can make a true difference in the world. Thank you. Many years ago, Vice President Hubert Humphrey said, we will not be remembered for the power of our weapons, but we will forever be remembered for the power of our compassion. One of the reasons I'm so proud to be part of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is that we honor people. And we honor people with compassion and people with dedication. We honor world citizens. We honor peace leaders. We live in a world where we've gotten very accustomed to the constant criticism and the tearing down of other human beings. It's wonderful to be here on an evening where we build people up, where we celebrate doing great things to make this world a better place. Over the years, we have honored a very impressive array of people. Leaders, great humanitarians, people who've spent their lives working for justice and peace. But what distinguishes our honoree tonight is that she was willing to risk her life for her cause. Dr. Judith Ann Mayotte, came very close to giving her life, and she did give her limb, because of her courage and her compassion for the displaced and the marginalized of this world. I've been reading many articles and many biographies about you, Dr. Mayotte, and the overriding theme of your life is compassion. Dr. Mayotte is a former nun, she was known as Sister Mary Vivia in the Sisters of Charity. She began her work in the inner cities and was later drawn, some people would say called, to the plight of refugees. She was appointed in 1994 by President Clinton as a special advisor on refugee issues. She spent many years working with refugees in Cambodia, Sudan, Pakistan, Etria, Mozambique, Malawi, Hong Kong, Tanzania, Thailand, Vietnam, and Ethiopia. She has slipped into war zones with rebel troops, dodged artillery shells, watched people die from landmines, starvation, and disease. Judith was willing to pay enormous personal price for her advocacy and intervention. Her credits are too numerous to mention here. I don't want to use her valuable time. We want to hear her speak. But just to name a few, she spent time as a television producer with the Turner Broadcasting Company. She produced Emmy award-winning shows. She wrote a book called Disposable People, which was published in 1992 about the plight of refugees. She's received many awards including the Georgetown University's Learning, Faith, and Freedom Medal. She's taught on many faculties, Seattle University, Johns Hopkins University, and the Department of Theology at Marquette University. She was featured in a segment of the PBS television series, Visionaries. Judith is currently a professor of theology in the department at Marquette University. And she also serves on the Desmond Tutu Peace Foundation Board and Operating Committee in connection with the Desmond Tutu Peace Center 
and Leadership Academy in Cape Town, South Africa. This past week, we received a very important message which I'd like to read to you at this time. Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu and Mrs. Leah Tutu, the Board of Direct Trustees and staff of the Desmond Tutu Peace Center in Cape Town, and the Board of Directors and staff of the Desmond Tutu Peace Foundation in New York, express their heartiest congratulations and deepest gratitude to Dr. Judith Miat for her dedication to creating a world in which peace and justice are possible for all human beings. We're honored to celebrate your achievements. On behalf of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, it gives me the greatest honor to present to you the 2009 World Citizenship Award for your compassion and for your dedication to alleviating the plight of refugees throughout the world. I'm very touched <laughs> and humbled. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you to each of you, David and everybody else who is a part of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and for the critical work that you continue to do. And I think all of us, again, ought to give a rousing round of applause of thanks to David and to everyone who's involved with the, with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. <clears throat> I really am humbled to receive this World Citizenship Award and do so on behalf of the millions of women around the world who work tirelessly to bring about a world of peace and justice. And thank you too, Rhianne Eisler, for your incredible life of commitment to world peace. We look forward to honoring you in a few minutes. When I think of the World Citizenship Award, I immediately think of a 1933 quote by one of our greatest women of peace, Eleanor Roosevelt. She exclaims, peacetime can be as exhilarating to the daredevil as wartime. There is nothing quite so exciting as creating a new social order. Today, you and I are sitting with the whole of humankind on the cusp of a potentially new world order. Hovering between the now and the not yet, we cut quiver with the excitement that comes with the opportunity to journey toward a new horizon, toward the possibilities to build and create, to re-envision and reimagine a world in which the earth and all its peoples can live sustainably and peacefully. At the same time, in our comfort with the status quo, or fear of the unknown, we firmly plant our feet in the here and now, hesitant to boldly embrace the challenges of the not yet. Another great woman for peace, Marian Wright Edelman, nudges us towards the not yet in these words. We are living at a time of unbearable dissonance between promise and performance between good politics and good policy, between calls for community and rampant individualism and greed, and between our capacity to prevent and alleviate human deprivation and disease and our political and spiritual will to do so. We are also living at an incredible moral moment in history, Edelman continues. How will we say thanks for the life earth, actions, and children, God has entrusted to our care. What legacies, principles, values, and deeds will we stand for and send to the future through our children, to their children, and to a spiritually confused, balkanized, and violent world desperately hungering for moral leadership and community? The answers, she says, lie in the values we stand for and the actions we take today. In calling for us to be daredevils for peace, we are challenged anew to change the very borders of our minds. 
We are living at a moment when powerful tectonic shifts challenge us as never before to change the way we think about and act with one another and towards the whole of creation. Historian theologian that I am by training, I have come to realize that no human devised historical event has to take place. We are rational people who choose what does and does not happen. We humans can use and we have used this tremendous power of choice to create catastrophe on a vast scale as well as to promote those things that bring peace and stability. We can choose to impoverish humanity and decimate Mother Earth or enrich our human family and together make peace with our planet. We can redirect our thinking and our choices for this is our world and the choices for solutions to the world's problems will be ours as well. Over a period of years, my life took me into the world of inhuman time, as George Steiner would name it, where some of the most horrible atrocities against humanity occurred because some chose to perpetrate them and others of us let them take place. I have entered war zones and camps where people have fled to find refuge in Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. In the ruins of towns and villages people once called home, I held children almost dead from starvation, saw people very freshly blown up by landmines, and conversed with women and children left alone, exploited and abused in their search for food. Among the ruins of a number of war-torn nations, I became tangibly aware of the centuries it takes to build a culture in a nation, and the few months or years it takes to obliterate the land and split apart the people who gave spirit and life to that particular culture and nation. With flight, the continuum of the lives of, of refugees is interrupted. The old is no more, the new not yet. They carry within themselves, as do we, both peace and war, love and hate, strength and fragility. They are forced to rethink and reshape their lives. Stagnated in the present, they continue to live with hope for a future that does not include bombs and torture, killing, flight, or economic meltdown due to callous and failed leadership. They dream of return to their homes and farms and towns where they will resurrect their songs and dances and their lives. Those individuals whose lives have been torn apart suffer both physically and spiritually. Listen for a moment to the words of two women. The first is that of a internally displaced Southern Sudanese woman a midwife who did not even have a clean razor blade with which to cut the umbilical cord in the birthing process. When I asked her what she would like, the message she'd like for me to carry beyond her borders so that others might understand the plight of forced displacement, she said, tell them we are tired of running, running from bombardments, massacres, and starvation. We gather our children and try to find a place to hide. Sometimes we stay in the bush for months. We look for water and try to stay a while, but then guns break the silence and we have to run again. The second is the, are the words of a Bosnian Muslim woman, one of a group who were held in a schoolroom by Bosnian Serb military and raped over and over again. Her words haunt me to this day. She said very simply, we have lost the picture of ourselves. We have lost the picture of ourselves. On behalf of these women and all those who become the detritus of war, the seemingly disposable people, South African Patricia Schuenstein in her book Skyline pleads as she gazes on the newly arrived, the sad and broken people who behind torn garments and dusty dreams of Africa whisper, turn our desolation into something memorable, that it might not have been in vain to lose what little we owned. 
make for our lost children a chime of gentle sound that they might follow it and escape one day from the plateau of war. We have lived long in a war and weapons mentality with tremendous cost in human lives, environmental degradation, and economic waste. Yet today, in these young years of the 21st century, we are gifted with myriad opportunities to become daredevils for peace and to ring out chimes of gentle sound for coming generations. Amid our many pressing and massive problems, we are called to live courageously and practically anew in our fragile yet beautiful world, among and interconnected with all Earth's inhabitants. As engaged, responsible global citizens and leaders, we can find solutions through collective positive action in addressing the world's common needs and problems. And we can address these issues with a healthy combination of idealism, that is, a vision of what ought to be, and realism, for we have the scientific knowledge and technology as well as keen imaginations. We know there are threats to our global security that loom as large as, if not larger, than nuclear conflagration and terrorist actions. Environmental consequences of climate change that include, for example, lack of access to clean, fresh water. Creeping deserts impairing the agricultural productive capacity, rampant deforestation, and proliferation of hazardous wastes. Then there are the issues of population density, increased mass migration due to life-threatening circumstances, human health challenges, lack of women's advancement, unabashed racism, disparities in educational opportunities, and a pervasive poverty. Just a minute, I need some water. <laughs> <clears throat> and a pervasive poverty that has created an underclass of nations, to name a few. These threats are the results of human choices on the part of ordinary citizens like you and me, as well as at the highest levels of government and business the world over. If we are to survive as a species, and if we are to live sustainably on our planet, we must tackle these threats. While there has been controversy over the decision by the Nobel Committee to award President Barack Obama the 2009 Nobel Peace Prize, I believe the intent of the committee was to call us all to live and act in a new way. In that spirit, President Obama accepted the award, in his words, as a call to action, a call for all nations and all peoples to confront the common challenges of the 21st century. President Obama calls each of us to action on many fronts, including to contribute to the critically important effort of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation to stem nuclear proliferation and more to bring about nuclear disarmament, beginning with calling on the US and Russia to commit to deep cuts in their nuclear arsenals so that others will follow, as well as engaging in nuclear dialogue with Iran and North Korea. Obama calls us to be seriously committed to halting global warming and rescuing the long-term future of Mother Earth and its peoples from a catastrophic point of no return in climate change. Obama calls us to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights that Eleanor Roosevelt championed through her involvement in bringing about the ratification of the International Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent human rights documents. He calls us to work tirelessly to ensure that all peoples enjoy the most basic human rights, the right to shelter, food, clean water, basic health care, education, and governance by rule of law. 
Following immediately upon the Oslo ceremony, President Obama, with other world leaders, will turn vital attention to the Copenhagen Conference on Climate Change. Just as the United States must step up to the plate first in nuclear disarmament, so too must the U.S., with the greatest urgency, lead the way in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Finding solutions to climate change belongs to each of us so that we can avert climactic disasters such as rising oceans that submerge low-lying islands, cyclones and hurricanes that make cities uninhabitable, and parched, drought-stricken farmlands that fail to provide sustenance. Climate change will loom larger as a factor among the already complex and complicated causes of violent conflict and will cause millions more to be on the move as migrants and refugees. If, however, we garner the moral and political will to act collectively, we will know that polar bears will have solid ice flows, mountain gorillas will thrive in lush forests, all creatures will breathe fresh air, and the fragile balance of life on Earth will be preserved. Najibullah Indabele, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Najibullah Indabele, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town and a committed global citizen, notes of his home country, although we have built millions of new houses, we did not build communities. The wonderful African notion of Ubuntu, wherein a person is a person only in relation to other persons, leads us to building community. This worldview values affirmation and acceptance of the other, interdependence, participation, openness, and concern for the common good. To live in a world of Ubuntu assumes forgiveness, reconciliation, and building cultures of peace. Desmond Tutu, whom you have honored here, says in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, this universe has been constructed in such a way that unless we live in accordance with its moral laws, we will pay the price for it. One such law is that we are bound together in what the Bible calls the bundle of life. Our humanity is caught up in that of all others. We are human because we belong. We are made for community, for togetherness, for family, to live in a delicate network of interdependence. May we live in a world of Ubuntu, joining together as a human community, as engaged, responsible global citizens, so that we might move towards creating a peace and openness that can take root and flourish in our homes, our communities, and our world. May we make chimes of gentle sound. We can affect change if we envision and believe that we belong to one another, if we are willing to be daredevils for peace, and if we see, in the words of poet Archibald MacLeish, that we are brothers and sisters, riders on the earth together. Thank you for this honor and thank you for this evening. It is truly an honor to induce, introduce Rian Eisler, who's receiving the Foundation's Distinguished Peace Leadership Award. When Stephen Crandell mentioned tonight's event to me a month or six weeks ago, I don't know what day it is anymore, um, I was instantly transported back in time about 19 years ago to my women, religion, and spirituality class at Skidmore College. And this class during my junior year there represented one of those experiences that challenged me to ask questions about the state of the world, women's roles in society, and how gender inequality can be so entrenched in our everyday lives and everyday thoughts. And perhaps most importantly, the class taught me to ask why and refuse to accept because it's always been that way as the appropriate answer. And if you've read any of our uh, honorees' books, you'll know, in fact, it hasn't always been this way. 
That college course may have ended 19 years ago, however, its overarching uh, lessons stayed with me to this day and helped me transform historical theories into everyday practices. Rianne Eisler's work embodies the challenge of transforming our personal choices into political statements and actions. As an author, social scientist, and lawyer, she has been a pioneer in showing how women's rights, and therefore human rights, are building blocks of world peace. Her 1987 international bestseller, The Chalice and the Blade, outlines the need for a cultural transformation, moving from the politics of dominance to the practice of partnership. As stated on her website, partnership politics takes us outside the box of conventional political conversation. Instead of arguing about religious versus secular, right versus left, Eastern versus Western, capitalist versus socialist, and so forth, we focus on the long-term policies foundational for a more peaceful, equitable, and environmentally sustainable world we all want and need. She concludes in The Chalice and the Blade, the most dramatic change as we move from a dominator to a partnership world will be that we and our children and grandchildren will again know what it means to live free of the fear of war in a world rid of the mandate that to be masculine, men must dominate, and along with the rising status of women and more feminine social priorities, the danger of nuclear annihilation will gradually diminish. There have been, there's been progress since this book was published in 1987. I think about Muhammad Yunus's social business model, focusing on microloans to primarily women in Bangladesh. And there's so many more examples like that around the world. Rianne Eisler was born in Vienna, fled from the Nazis with her parents to Cuba, and later emigrated to the United States. She obtained degrees in sociology and law from the University of California, taught pioneering classes on women and the law at UCLA, and now teaches in the transformative leadership program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. She's a founding member of the General Evolution Research Group, GERG, <laughs> I like that, a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and World Business Academy, a counselor of the World Future Council, and a commissioner of the World Commission on Global Consciousness and Spirituality, along with the Dalai Lama and other spiritual leaders. She is co-founder with Nobel Peace Laureate Betty Williams of the Spiritual Alliance to Stop Intimate Violence and president of the Center for Partnership Studies dedicated to research and education. She's been named as one of the world 20 great peacemakers. And I have to, I just learned that uh, she actually injured herself before coming up here today and, and uh, but wanted to make sure she was here with all of us today. And I'm so honored uh, to be able to introduce Rianne Eisler here. And, and on behalf of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is pleased to present the 2009 Distinguished Leadership, Distinguished Peace Leadership Award for her commitment to building a culture of peace through education, social justice, and gender equality. Thank you all, and thank you, Helene, for that lovely introduction. It is for me a great honor to be with you here at this absolutely beautiful event. Um, I am so moved and awed by everything that I have witnessed here. And of course, it is wonderful to share the stage with this remarkable, courageous woman whose life and work, Judith, is really emblematic of women's leadership for peace and justice. And it is certainly an honor to follow in the footsteps of such distinguished leaders as the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu in receiving this Distinguished Peace Leadership Award. And yes, it's been an absolute joy for me to talk with so many of you here, dedicated to a nuclear-free world, to that saner, saner, safer world that we so want and need. And I really want to say bless you and thank you for everything that you are doing. 
so that we can have this better world. Now, I would like to actually introduce somebody else who's very special, who's here with me very briefly. Uh, my husband, the distinguished uh, social scientist and award-winning author and wonderful partner, Dr. David Loy. Now, I've been asked in the short time that we have together tonight to tell you a little about myself and my work. And I want to start by thanking David Krieger and all the others of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, not only for this wonderful award, which I will cherish, but for calling this evening Women for Peace. Because... This designation recognizes something of enormous importance, the key role of the female half of humanity in building what in my work and the work of many others now, we call cultures of peace. And I'd like to suggest to you that both this concept of cultures of peace and the growing recognition of the importance of women's roles in moving to a less violent world are building blocks. Building blocks for a new integrated phase in the global peace movement, based on the recognition that to move forward, we need a systemic approach. Because I think most of us here recognize that we stand at a critical point in human history and human evolution, and that going back to the old normal, where peace is just an interval between wars, because that's what it's been, hasn't it? That that is not an option. That what we really need is something different. What we need is a cultural transformation. And those of you familiar with my work know that this cultural transformation has been the focus of my research, my multidisciplinary, <coughs> cross-cultural, historical research. And I, too, am going to need some water. Uh -huh. <coughs> well, if somebody can bring me some, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> examining... Well, examining two contrasting social configurations. Uh, what I have identified as the configurations of a domination system and a partnership system. Because as Einstein said, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. And if we really think only in terms of the old categories, right, left, religious, secular, eastern, western, northern, southern, capitalist, socialist, uh, we really can't move forward. What we need is to look at social systems from a new perspective that can help us build not only a nuclear free world, but that better world we so urgently want and need. Now, um, I have a great passion for this world of peace, for building, for contributing to it. And I have that passion not only as a scholar and a writer, and yes, as a social activist, but also as a mother and a grandmother deeply concerned, as so many of us are, about what kind of future our children will inherit. And that passion uh, is rooted in my own early childhood experiences. Because in terms of this new conceptual framework that I'm going to very briefly allude to tonight, the partnership domination continuum, because it's always a matter of degree, I was born in Europe, in Vienna, at a time of massive regression to the domination side 
It was the rise to power of the Nazis, first in Germany and then in my native Austria. So from one day to the next, my whole world was rent asunder. My parents and I, we became hunted with license to kill. And I watched in horror on Crystal Night, so-called, as many of you know, because of all the glass that was shattered in Jewish homes and synagogues and businesses, as a gang of Gestapo men broke into our home and dragged my father away. So I witnessed brutality and violence. But I also witnessed something else that night that made an equally profound impression on me, what I today call spiritual courage. You know, we've been taught, haven't we? Courage is the courage to out and kill the enemy, right? But spiritual courage is a much more deeply human courage. It's the courage to stand up against injustice out of love. And my mother displayed that courage. She could have been killed for standing up to the Nazis that came, for demanding that my father be given back to her, because many people were killed that night. But by a miracle, she wasn't. Uh, by a miracle, yes, uh, some money eventually did pass hands, but it wouldn't have happened if my mother hadn't stood up. My father was released, and we were able to escape. And we escaped to Cuba. And I grew up in the industrial slums of Havana, because of course the Nazis confiscated. You know, that's an official word for armed robbery. Everything that my parents owned. And it was also there that I learned that most of my family, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, most of them were killed by the Nazis as would have happened to us had we not, by this miracle, escaped. Now, these traumatic experiences led me to questions that most of us have asked. I'm sure most of you have asked this at some point in your lives. Does it have to be this way? Does there have to be so much injustice, cruelty, violence, destructiveness? Uh, when we humans also have such a great capacity, as I saw in my mother, for caring, for sensitivity, for love. Is it, as we're all too often told, and this is one of the big mythologies of domination systems, it's just human nature, right? You've heard that. Uh, or are there alternatives? And if so, what are they? And it was these questions that eventually led to my research, and I found very early on that I simply could not find answers, as I said, by, well, in terms of the old social categories, you know, right, left, religious, secular, eastern, western, northern, southern. I mean, first of all, none of these categories, if you really think about it, uh, describe the configuration of a system. They just focus on this or that, or another aspect of the system. And none of them, none of them really answer that most critical question for our future, the question of what kinds of beliefs, what kinds of values, and yes, what kinds of social institutions from the family, education, religion, to politics and economics support or inhibit either our enormous human capacities, uh, well, for caring, for consciousness, for creativity, the capacities that really are most developed in us as human beings, that make us uniquely human, or those other capacities, which we obviously also have, for cruelty, insensitivity, and violence. In other words, I started from the premise that is today being verified by neuroscience, and I'm writing about that in my new book that I'm working on, that we humans have genetic possibilities for many different kinds of behaviors, but that whether these behaviors are expressed, these genetic possibilities are expressed or inhibited, is profoundly affected well, by our experiences, and of course we all know, don't we, that these experiences are in turn profoundly affected by the kinds of cultures or subcultures 
as mediated by families, education, religion, politics, and economics that we live in. So I started to look for cultural patterns from a very, using a very, very large database, both cross-culturally and historically. And it was possible, because of this large database, to really begin to see configurations, patterns, that kept repeating themselves, cross-culturally and historically. There were no names for them, so I chose the terms partnership system and domination system. In all my books, my more recent books, that is, Many of uh, The Chalice and the Blade, Sacred Pleasure, uh, Tomorrow's Children, which is on education, and most recently my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, draw from this research. And all these books now describe connections. You know, we hear so much about connections these days, and there's a reason. Connections that we need to understand to build a nuclear-free world, a better world. Connections between what in a society is considered normal in national or tribal or intertribal or international relations and what is also considered normal in our intimate family and other relations. Why? Well, once you articulate it, it sounds perfectly self-evident, doesn't it? Because it is in these primary relations which are still not taken into account in most studies of society that people first learn on a basic neural level, as we know today from neuroscience, what is normal or abnormal, what is moral or immoral, what is possible or impossible. And I just want to give you a few examples of these connections. Consider for a moment, and I'm asking you to really think in terms of these configurations rather than the old categories, what happens when children uh, are born into cultures or subcultures where violence in families is accepted as normal, even moral? What lesson do they really learn? The lesson is simple, isn't it? That it's okay, even moral, to use violence to impose one's will on others. Now, fortunately, many people reject this. Many of us have experienced these kinds of childhoods, and we've said no, because the human impulse is no. But unfortunately, a substantial majority, as we see all over the world, not only accept these traditions of violence and domination in intimate relations, they then uh, really generalize that to considering violence appropriate in other relations, including, of course, international relations. Now, we see this cross-culturally and historically. And I just want to give you two examples of two cultures that, from the conventional perspective, are totally different. The Nazis in Germany and the Taliban of Afghanistan. Okay, Eastern, Western, technologically developed, indeveloped, uh, secular, religious, etc. But if you really carefully look at these warlike, very, very warlike, very authoritarian, cultures, cultures that really orient to the domination side of the continuum very closely, you see something very interesting. One of their top priorities is going back to a, quote, traditional family. You've heard that, haven't you? And it's their code word, isn't it, for a rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive family. Now, this is not coincidental, my friends, nor is it coincidental that these kinds of societies idealize warfare, even consider it holy. Neither is it coincidental that in these kinds of societies, masculinity, male identity, is equated with domination and violence, and on the other hand, anything, women and anything stereotypically, associated with the feminine, you know, the soft, 
empathy, caring, nonviolence, that is devalued. So I would like to suggest to you, first of all, that this has nothing to do with anything inherent in women or men, okay? I mean, we're seeing all these men today who are doing fathering, you know, the way only mothering was supposed to be done. We're seeing women getting into areas that were once considered just a male preserve. But these are dominator gender stereotypes. And I'd like to suggest to you, and that really takes us to Women for Peace, that it is really very, very important that we start talking about something that, yeah, that makes people uncomfortable, gender. Uh, we might as well put it on the table. People don't want to talk about it, do they? But let's remember what the great sociologist Lewis Worth said. He said that the most important things about a society are those that people don't want to talk about. We saw that with race. We started to talk more about it. We started to move forward a little. And now we're beginning to talk a little bit more about gender, aren't we? And we're beginning much too slowly to move forward. But consider that it is through dominator norms for gender that children learn another very important lesson. And this is to equate difference, beginning with the most fundamental difference in our species between female and male, with either superiority or inferiority, with either dominating or being dominated, with either being served or serving. And then that mental and emotional map, which again, people acquire before their critical faculties are formed, before their brains are even fully developed. We know that our brains don't develop until our early 20s completely. Uh, they then can generalize that, can't they? And do to a different race, to a different religion, to a different ethnicity, to a different sexual orientation. So this is why I think it is so very important that we really, as I said, start thinking of a systemic approach. We have a, all of us here working for a better world, for a nuclear free world, uh, because to have a nuclear free world, we really have to connect those dots, don't we? We have to make those connections. We have to have the foundations, don't we, on which to build that more peaceful world. So I'm going to suggest to you that uh, this question of women for peace goes very deeply. It goes to the matter of how the roles and relations of the two halves of humanity are structured. And that if we are to create a more equitable and peaceful world, we can no longer consider these as, quote, just women's issues. Of course, we're half of humanity, we're actually the majority, but that just goes to show you, doesn't it, how devalued women and anything associated with women has been and how we've been conditioned to do that. Let me give you an example. My last book is The Real Wealth of Nations, and it's on economics. Now, you would never think that economics has anything to do with gender, would you? I mean, yeah, you read about uh, the uh, discrimination in the workplace against women. Finally, you know, we're acknowledging that. But it goes so much deeper. It is the systemic effects. Have you ever wondered, for example, why it is that so many politicians always have money, always have money for weapons, for wars, for prisons, right? But when it comes to funding the soft, caring for people, and also caring for our Mother Earth, you know, environmental housekeeping, you know, keeping a clean environment, that sort of women's work in the household, health care, child care, somehow they don't have money. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that this has to do with this gendered system of values that we've inherited from earlier, more domination-oriented times, and that we have to make it visible. In The Real Wealth of Nations, I basically propose that it's time that we move past the old argument of capitalism versus socialism and vice versa. Because, look, uh, 
the latest phase of capitalism, neoliberalism, that's really dominator economics, isn't it? What is trickle-down economics? It's uh, this notion that those on bottom should content themselves with the scraps dropping from the opulent tables of those on top, right? And freedom, by, when it's used by those in economic control, it means freedom for them to do whatever they please, including destroying our Mother Earth. Uh, as for socialism, the two large-scale applications of socialism, the Soviet Union and China, uh, both became dominator regimes, didn't they? Highly authoritarian, violent, terrible environmental problems. Now, that's not to say that we don't need to hang on to the partnership elements in both capitalism and socialism, because there are those. But we also need to leave the dominator elements behind. But we need to move further to what I call a caring economics. Now, you know, uh, isn't it interesting when people hear caring and economics in the same sentence, you do a double take, don't you? And isn't that a terrible comment on the uncaring values that we have learned to accept as driving economic systems? And I'd like to also suggest to you that it's not coincidental that caring is a, quote, soft or feminine term, and that we're always told that it's not effective. Uh, in fact, and this is something that I show again and again in The Real Wealth of Nations, caring policies and practices are not only effective in human and environmental terms, but in purely financial terms. And I have lots of studies uh, showing that businesses with more caring policies are more successful. But let's get to public policy for a moment, and I want to close with this, because I think it's very important to show that what we are trying to do, and more, to move to a more, well, a more sane and safe and equitable world is possible. And if you look at some of the nations in our world that have been moving more towards what I call the partnership configuration, uh, the Nordic nations, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, you see something very interesting. These nations were dirt poor at the beginning of the 20th century, so poor that there were famines. Today, these nations have not only regularly appeared in the top ranks of the United Nations Human Development Reports, but in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Reports. And yes, they have done this to a large extent because they have more soft, caring policies, universal health care, universal child care, paid parental leave, elder care with dignity. Uh, now, these are not ideal societies, but they show that we can move to the partnership side, and that's exactly what they did. And I promised you I would give you the configuration of the partnership system, and I will illustrate through these nations what I'm talking about. Not that they're ideal, but look. For one thing, these nations, and that's the first part of the configuration, they have much more democracy and equality in both the family and the state, in both. Second, these nations, if you really look at them, have been in the forefront of trying to leave behind traditions of violence, that's right, that we've inherited. You know where the first peace studies came from? The Nordic nations. Do you know where the first laws saying that it's against the law to use physical discipline against children came from? The Nordic nations. And the third part of the configuration, yes, they have a much more equal partnership between the female and male halves of humanity. Women are 40% for 0% of the national legislature. Now, this is very interesting because what I'm trying to help explain is connecting the dots, looking at configurations. What happens is that as the status of women rises, men no longer find it such a threat to their status, to their, quote, masculinity, to also embrace more caring practices and policies. And you know, these 
nations have a very powerful men's movement to disentangle masculinity from its dominator association with violence domination. They also have a very strong men's movement for men to take responsibility for violence against women and children, which is a tradition that we have inherited worldwide. Now, I want to say to you, uh, the statistics on what I call intimate violence are horrendous. You can get some of them on the website of the Spiritual Alliance to Stop Intimate Violence, save, S-A-I-V dot net. But to sum it up, between child battering, wife beating, rape, sexual mutilation of girl children and women, uh, bride burnings, so-called honor killings, and other horrors, do you know that the lives taken and blighted by intimate violence worldwide are much higher than those taken by armed conflicts. And yet, it's invisible, isn't it? So it's our job to make it visible and to move towards this integrated phase. Because look, if we really want a nuclear-free world, you can't just tack that on, can you, to a system that idealizes masculinity as violence, that devalues the so-called feminine, whether it's in a woman or a man, caring, caregiving, you know, sissies, wimps, effeminate, those are insults, aren't they? Uh, let's take a systemic approach. Let's really move together into that second phase, that so urgently needed phase at this critical time in our human history of the peace movement. And yes, let's do it together. Let's do it for ourselves. Let's do it for our children. Let's do it for generations to come. I thank you.